John chapter 21, verse 14, which we've read these last couple weeks here, but it said, this is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. Now skip down there to verse 18. <clears throat> the last couple of weeks we looked at those other verses. But for this week, let's look at verse 18. Verily, and this is Jesus speaking to Peter, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young... Thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest, but when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said unto him, here it is, follow me. This is what we're going to be looking at today. Follow me. Verse 20. Then Peter, turning around or turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved, following, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, what shall, and Lord, what shall this man do? Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Here it is again, follow thou me. Then went this saying abroad among the brethren that the disciple should not die. Yet Jesus said not unto him, he shall not die. But if I will tarry, or if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Shall we pray? Father, we thank you again for your word. Help us to get into the scriptures and help us to understand them. Help us to make the scriptures a part of our daily lives. Help us to live in accordance to your word and to your truth. And Father, help us to, to shed out the, the, the world of, uh, of uh, uh, rumors and, and, and just, Lord, untruths that are out there. And help us to stay in with your will, your word. And Father, make it change us, Lord. May we humble ourselves to it and may we be boldened for you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, John 21, verses 14 to 23, that, that, that's that, that third and final time that, that Jesus speaks with his disciples, and especially, especially Peter, okay? So the, it records this, this last time that, that he gets together with, with his disciples after his resurrection. And we looked at, and if you just go to the next slide, please, it, we looked at the, the very first week, a couple of weeks ago, we looked at the, three, the test of three fellowships, Remember that? And, and, and Jesus was, was talking to, to Peter, and this is, they just finished dining, and he's talking to Peter, and he says, do you love me? And we, we looked at that, and in other words, he was saying, do you love me tremendously? Because he was comparing it to everybody else. Do you love me more than these? Peter, do you love me more than these other disciples who are your friends and colleagues? Do you love me the most? Do you love me tremendously? And of course, Peter's response was, I like you. Okay, and this is definitely, this is actually a good uh, Valentine's message. Guys, if your wife says, do you love me, don't say I like you, okay, because that does not work. It didn't cut it with Jesus and, P and uh, Peter in that relationship either. He goes, really? So he lowers it a little bit, and we looked at this a couple of weeks ago too, and he says, do you love me tenderly? In other words, he said, Peter, do you love me? Do you, I mean, is there love there at all? Maybe, maybe you love me as much as these other guys, maybe not as much, but do you love, is there a love there anyway between us? And again, Peter says uh, in his manly voice, I like you. Mm. Okay, so we're looking at these, these tests here of, of, of fellowship. And, we're, and, they're, and they're kind of in, in a descending order. So then he lowers it again. Boom, down to the bottom. And, he, and this is what grieved Peter because he asked him the third time and he lowered it and he changed it. He says, not do you love me, he says, do you like me? Do you like me? Is there anything going on between us? Do we have some kind of communication relationship here? And he said... Yeah, I like you. And he stayed with that. And that's kind, of, that's kind of the level he was at at that time. So he had some where to go, didn't he? He had some growing to do. And what I like about that is that we all have some growing to do in our lives with the Lord. We all do. And I mean, if, if this is Peter, I mean, if he's having this issue, then, you know, we have this issue with God, don't we? It's always really, our, our, our greatest struggles and trials are really relationship ones. I mean, yeah, financial, yes, health, those are very important things. But one of the things that really gets a lot of people is, is, is relationships. I don't know, I'm not an expert on, on suicide, but I, I do know the, the people that I've, I've been involved with and stuff like that and have heard about 
who have killed themselves, a lot of them, more than their health, more than their finances, the relationship will destroy them. I mean, people that have everything else going for them. You see these people, they're celebrities, they got all kinds of money and everything else, and they're, and they're youth, and, and they got all this stuff, but they have horrible relationships, and that's what kills them. It's horrible. It, it, it's what can happen. And how much more for people who don't have a relationship with God? Uh, and so P- Peter's re- really being worked on by the Lord here, in this, this third final thing. And then if you go to the next slide, please, Theron, we saw last week, we saw the task of three feedings. And he was speaking specifically uh, to Peter about his role as a pastor. And I don't think Peter really fully realized what he was going to be up against, what his new vocation was going to be. He was a fisherman, and he was following Jesus. And I, he was definitely prepared to be in ministry. He was acting in ministry. They were going out. They did knocking on doors and soul winning. They were there for the preaching and all these other things and, and trying to lead the, the Israelites to a, a knowledge that their Messiah had come. And he was doing all that, but he, I don't think he really realized that he, what, I don't, well, there wasn't a church before. Jesus had just started this. There had never been a pastor before. He didn't even know what that, all that was. So, so he's trying to uh, show and teach Peter these three different levels. And these are just, just different levels, and, and they're, the, the, the fellowship was going down. And these ones, as he goes to the next step, it's the progressive. And so he says, first of all, he says, uh, it was the discipleship level. He said to Jesus, he says, I want you to feed my lambs. I want you to formally instruct. I want you to disciple the ones that come to, to me, uh, Peter. I want you to disciple them. I want you to take time and, and feed them the milk of the word. You know, and again, last week we had a picture of, of, a, of a lamb, a baby, you know, a baby sheep, a baby lamb, a young one. Maybe the eyes are just barely open and, and having being bottle fed by the shepherd. And he says, I want you to feed my lambs. And then the second one, he says, I also want you to do this. He says, I want you to direct them. He says, I want you to feed my sheep. And that word feed, as we looked at last week, is a little bit different. And it meant to, to actually lead, take the, the control over, to, to lead. And it's talking about a, a practical sense of training. Take them out. Get them out into the pastures. Take the sheep out. Put them in, in situations that are not comfortable or usual to them. And, and let them experience what it is like to be a Christian and have to deal with things in their lives. And it's, it's one thing to be sheltered by your parent in church, but eventually you've got to grow up. Eventually, you have to make your way in life. And I know as, as parents, we're like this all the time, and we're always worried about our children. Boy, I hope they make it okay. I, I hope they, they stay true to the Lord. And, but the, the fact of the matter is, it comes a time when yeah, they have to stand on their own. And it's good if you've got a church and you've got a pastor that loves them, and you've got, uh, got someone who can train them, who can feed the sheep as well. As the lambs, you've got to feed the sheep because they've got to get out to the pasture. They've got to leave, they gotta leave the stable. Okay, and uh, that's what I, I like about uh, Jesus being born in the stable. He didn't stay there, did he? Oh, he was a cute baby, and we all celebrate him at Christmas time and stuff like that. But he had to grow to be a man. And the Bible says he waxed strong, and he was he was a man's man. Jesus was. And what I love about Jesus Christ is, if you study the, he was a man who still was in touch with his heart. He talked about love. He talked about relationships, and yet he was still a man, a strong man, too. He was a great example to us. So we have that. He says, I want you to direct, Peter, I want you to direct the sheep. I want you to feed my sheep. And then finally, he said the third time, he said, again, I want you to feed my sheep. And this time, feed meant the same as it did the first time and, uh, that was used uh, with the lambs. In other words, I want you to also take the Bible, and I want you to feed them the meat of the word. As you feed my lambs the milk of the word, eventually they get out and get them in ministry, get them out training and stuff like that. And eventually you've got to take them, and now you've got to feed them a little bit differently. You've got to feed them now the meat of the word. Get into the doctrines. Get, get them out there so they know the word of God, so they can use it practically in their lives. And, uh, I mean, there's so many things today. And that, that's why I can stand and boldly say that NASA and all these governments around the world, when they're trying to go on Mars and they're trying to find life on other planets, what a dumb thing to do. You're wasting our billions and maybe trillions of dollars. Why? Because I know the Word of God. I know because I've gone out into some other things and I see the Word of God, the whole action is right here on planet Earth, isn't it? God created Earth special. Well, the Earth's not special. It revolves around the sun like the other planets. Oh, no, it's special, very much so. What man sees, God, God sees differently. He said, I created this planet, he says, and it's a special thing. And that's just one example of so many things. And so when the people tell you, you know, this person couldn't help it, he had to steal, he had to hurt this person, he had to kill this person because it's the way he was raised, you know, evolution and all. 
We know differently, don't we, as we know the, get to know the Word of God. No, everybody's responsible for their own actions. No, no, no. You didn't, you didn't get ingrained with something from your, your forefathers thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of years ago. No, you were created by an Almighty God that, not that long ago. And you were brought into this world, and you're responsible for your own actions. You can't hide behind other things. Man, we got all kinds of stuff back there, messed up and, and, because people don't know the meat of the Word. And some of the people that are leading this are people with theology degrees. They're, they're messed up with, with all these other uh, uh, psychology. And I'm not against all the, these, these things and stuff of, uh, per se, but when they get away from the Word of God, man, they get messed up. It all goes back to feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. They have to know the truth. And again, that doesn't mean banging pulpits and yelling, screaming over and over and over again the same thing like it's a chant. No, get the Bible open and teach these people. Show them that I'm real. Show them alive. Show them I'm relevant. Show them that the Word of God is alive for every generation. Very relevant. It will change their lives and help them see things squarely. So anyway, so we saw the, 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 this task of the three feedings. And Peter, I can only imagine, folks, he's not, I don't know if he's getting this or not. They just finished eating. You know, he's, he's getting accustomed that Jesus came back from the dead. I mean, he's getting used to all this stuff, and he's laying this stuff on him. as they go for this walk. And then we'll, we'll go to the next slide, please, and we see today what we looked at. And this is the tale of three followings. A tale of three followings. And, and this final set of threes is in a logical order. It's a logical order. Jesus is walking with Peter through a, a uh, or I'm walking Peter through a process of understanding his obligation as a Christian and as a leader. And he says there, if you look there in, in John 21, verse 18, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest, but when thou shalt be old, Thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. And so we have this, this, uh, this other talk that he has. There's a lot going on here in this little talk, you know? Wouldn't that be cool? You go up with Jesus, and you're having some fish. The next thing you have a little bit of fish fry. The next thing you're right into this heavy conversation. And this, this short conversation just, just has so much to it. And so this third uh, series of threes, as we'll look at here, it, he starts talking about, if you go just hit that button there, to the deadly, uh, deadly command, he say, we're, we're going to see where he says to Peter, follow me. Because he, say, he starts off by saying, he says, verily, verily. Uh, now that word verily, it's used twice. It's interesting because it comes from a Greek word that we use a lot. It's been used here already, okay? And it's amen. Jesus said, literally said in the Greek, he said, amen. So they're walking down there, and he goes, amen, amen. All right? Now, at the end of a, of a conversation or the end of a service, we would say amen, and that means so be it. Thus saith the Lord. It's like that stamp of approval. God said it. It's true. Let it be. Boom. When it's used at the beginning of a conversation, it means of a truth. In other words, the person saying it is trying to get your attention. This is very serious. This is a serious matter, and he's trying. And so he says, amen, amen, to, you can just kind of picture, they're, they're walking by, and they're walking by the seaside, really. They just finished getting out of the boats and having a fish fry, and they're walking by the sea, and if you could just see these two men going by, and he's using it in that tongue, he's saying, amen, amen, to, to Peter. In other words, I want you to listen carefully, Peter. Remember, we looked a couple of weeks ago, he used them by his, his, his official full name, and he said, Simon. Uh, son of Jonas, and now he says, he, he makes it even more em uh, emphasis, he puts more emphasis on it, and after saying that, calling him by his official name, his full name, then he says, amen, amen. In other words, I want you to listen very carefully. I'm, I'm, I'm closing down this conversation we're having, and I want you to really get this. And so we have this, 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 this way of going. He's getting their attention. And he says, when thou wast young. Now, notice this is in the past tense. Peter, when you were young. Okay? Jesus is drawing a comparison between Peter's, Peter's life in the past as a fisherman and his future ending in his new life as a fisher of men. All right? He goes, I want you to compare some things here, Peter. According to Jesus' assessment, in his past life, Peter had a physical strength to him. 
And he had a financial, economic strength to him. He was a businessman. He was a fisherman. He owned his own boats. I mean, they, 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 they had their own income. They had to trade and buy and sell. And, and he had, with that comes this freedom. He had this total freedom. When you're a free man in, in a free society, and you got some money and you got some business going, you got connections and stuff like that. He had that in his small town. He said, you could go wherever you want, Peter. When you were young, you could go wherever you want. You had, you had that freedom. And, and fishing, fishing was good to him, you know. It, it, it really made, made his life, uh, it, it was stable. You know what you're doing the next day, don't you? Get up in the morning, you can do the next day. Go on fishing. All right, and after that, we've got to bring in the fish, and we've got to clean the nets. We've got to do this, and we get it set up for the next day. And then he, he, it's, there's a stability in having work. Well, that's what I liked about work is that, it, that there's a stability. There's something I, I look, look forward to, I, and I kind of know what I have to do. But there's also, when you start making a steady income, there's a stability that way, too. I all of a sudden I have some money, and I can, I can do some things. I got some freedom. And maybe you can buy a vehicle or, and drive, drive around. I don't know. Good luck paying the gas bill nowadays. It costs a little bit much. But when I was young, I could do that because gas was cheap. And now a little older, maybe, maybe not so much so. But, I, but there's some freedom that goes with it. And that's what, that's what Peter enjoyed. He had the strength. And fish, fishing was good to him. But then came Jesus into his life and changed it. Folks, I want you to get this. Is that when Jesus comes into your life, it, it might be a change in a way you're not thinking it will be. Because Peter, this man who, who could make his own money, he had his own friends, his own family, we know he was married and all this stuff, he had all these things going for him. Jesus comes into his life and all of a sudden he loses some of his freedom. Interesting, isn't it? Then think about it. Before you got married, you had more freedom. You get married, you got a relationship, you get children. More relationships, more responsibilities. And you know what? Less freedom. But it's worth it. You've got to waste, weigh the cost. And you say, it, it, it can be really worth it in these relationships. But it does take away some of your freedom. You don't have what you had before. And this is what Peter was finding too. His new life in Jesus Christ actually took away some of the freedom. He maybe was able to talk a little more freer. Maybe he was able to do things that, and, and, and not have to be responsible to God directly. Can you imagine? We're responsible to God, but can you imagine if God's physically right there with you? That's going to kind of hinder you a little bit, isn't it? You can't say and do everything you want because he's right physically there. And this is, so he, he, he had to get used to it as he was maturing and Jesus was now in his life. He had to forego some things. He had to give up some, some freedoms. As a pastor, I have to give up some freedoms to be, if I want to be a pastor anywhere. I can't just do everything and, and go willy-nilly and get involved in every cause and everything else because I'm responsible to everybody that's in this church. Okay, but it's worth it. Okay, it's worth it. When you take on a leadership role, you have to think about this. And so I can't, no, I can't always just be myself. I can't, not always, because there's a responsibility that's involved. So there's things that you have to give up. If, if you, it doesn't matter what, what type of leadership you're in, you have to give up certain things. And you live more in a fishbowl and you have to watch yourselves. So this is what he's saying. He says, you remember, you remember, Peter, when you were a young man, you were strong. You could do whatever you want. You could get up in the morning. You could, I mean, you had it made. You, 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 were, you were going places. But things are about ready to change. And uh, what was once a, a self-willed, Young men, man was learning now to be submissive to the will of another man. Jesus became the master of Peter's life, but this transition took years before it was successful. Let me ask you this. How's your relationship to Jesus Christ? Are you submissive to him? Or are you that person struggling for your own might, your own will, your own right, your own way to go? Because we all do. Peter was no different than us. I think Peter was, I don't know if I'd be, be com comfortable around Peter because he sounds like a very hard-working, got-it-together kind of guy, you know? And he had to learn over years that he had to let that self-will go and he had to submit himself to the will of the master. Boy, that's a tough one for us. 
That is very tough. So the encouragement I gain from the Gospels is that if the lead apostle had a problem, okay, with this issue and he struggled with it, then it's okay for me to at least acknowledge that I have a problem in that issue too, in that area too. I have a problem with my will. Sometimes it's not thy will, Lord, it's my will. And I fight like that. Oh, if I would only learn to submit and trust the Lord. We don't always trust Him. We don't always think He's got it together. It's shame. It's a shame. When we're born again Christians, we have the Word of God. It's not that we're without faith. It's not that we don't. But there's still that part inside of us that says, maybe God, maybe I can choose for myself. I can make myself happier than if I do it God's way. What foolishness. And yet, we keep fighting all the time. We're fighting that flesh all the time. To become a a born-again follower of Jesus Christ, one must learn to submit. And uh, he has to learn that all of our great works are just filthy rags in the eyes of an almighty God. Submit. He's got it together. And after the the new spiritual birth in Christ, uh, we have to learn that we have to take up our cross, and it takes humility and walk in, in, in his footsteps on a day-by-day basis with our own cross and just let go of things and it's humility. But you see, in this world, we have a world where if a real man's going to be a real man, he's going to stand up and he's going to fight and he's going to do this and do that. Really? Because God's view of a real man is a man who will submit to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's not exactly what I see in the commercials. When they're drinking their beer and they're at their party and they're in the pub and they're and they're drinking and they're all like that, and that's what a real man is. He's got freedom. He's got. That's not Christian. And they laugh at us. They do. They don't understand us. And some of the greatest men I've ever known were men who learned, who learned to walk with the Savior by submitting to Him. That takes a real man to do that because you have to lay down your armament for the Savior. Not natural. Total submission. Total submission. There, there have always been boundaries placed upon us. I mean, I, I think about the Garden of Eden. I think about Adam and Eve and stuff. Even when things were, were right, even when and God says in His words, good, when everything was good, there were still boundaries upon he, the human being. They, they, they couldn't, could they do anything? Could they do everything? Could they go anywhere, do whatever they want? No, there was one, one tree I like how God did this. He gave them the world, and specifically in the one part of the world, a garden. Okay, it was already primed, ready to go, a home base, and yet they stood the rest of the world. They had everything they wanted. It was all good. You know, there there was no, we weren't going to get these these ultraviolet rays and skin cancer, nothing. It was beautiful. It was perfect. It was this great environment, and and they, they could do whatever they want. And, and, and Adam was a little upset, so God, God says, well, here, I'll give you a help meet, because you were lonely. Got everything. You got it all. One tree. One tree. The fruit from that one tree, you can't eat it. Oh, you can look at it. Actually, it didn't even say you couldn't pull it, pull it down and look at it. But you can't eat it. Do not eat of it. Okay? Eve chose the counsel and the company of Satan just so that she would have the freedom because that's what he, he promised her, didn't he? He said, is it true that you, you, know, you, you, you can't uh, do everything? He was, he was doing that, that freedom thing. Oh, no, we could do everything. I goes, well, 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 there's that one tree we can't. Ah, the mind starts thinking. There's the one area over there that I, I don't have control over. See, we want it all. God did that on purpose. So she listens to the counsel. And takes on the company of Satan, takes the fruit, and eats it. Okay? Soon after that, Adam chooses the counsel and the company of Eve over God. Either way, they chose wrong. They chose away from God. So this is what, 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 what Peter is, is having this conversation with, with Jesus when he says, follow me. It's not an easy thing, folks. I mean, it's a quick verse to read. But it's not an easy thing to do, because this is what you have to do the rest of your lives. As a Christian, this is the task for the rest of your lives, is to let down your armament and to follow Jesus Christ, wherever He leads. That is the task. That's all you have to do. 
That's all. I mean, it's not really that difficult, the Christian life in that sense. It's just that you just have to submit. Very difficult for us to do because when we're born into this world, we're still born with that sin nature that we got from Adam and Eve. And we're born struggling for our own rights. And then when you get to be a teenager, oh, is that horrific on the parents. Because you see, you used to be able to kind of restrain them a bit. But as they get to, to a certain age, then they get out into school and they get their own friends. They get, some of them start getting a little job, their own money. They start getting things, start making their own choices. And uh, internally, there's changes in their life, uh, uh, biologically. And all these changes, all of a sudden, they're getting to a point where they're saying, you know, wait a minute. I'm big enough. I'm going to make my own choices. Harry, I said to my mom, take off the bowl. <laughs> take off the bowl. I'm going to cut my own hair and get somebody else to cut it. There comes a time, and it's really horrible on the parents, I guess it's a way, but, but it's, it's, it's that thing. But what the, they have to learn is that there's a responsibility with freedom, isn't there? There's that responsibility. And so, yeah, so they're, they're fighting it all the time. And so when a baby's born, the baby's struggling and fighting. And when they become a teenager, they're struggling and fighting. And it seems like the rest of our lives, we're struggling and fighting for this freedom, this control to make our own decisions. And then along comes Jesus in our lives. And he throws everything off. Because Jesus said, no, I want the control. Well, wait a minute. I just fought my whole life to get to this spot. Like Peter's saying, I got my business going, I got my fishing, I got people working for me, I got, I, got, I got people working with me, I got all these things going. I work so hard to get this. I'm married, I got my own home, everything's going good, and now you're going to take away that freedom from me, Lord. And he goes, yeah, follow me. Follow me, submit. Oh, yeah. And then he says, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. That word girdest, he says, when you were young, you girdest yourself. And it, it's related to another word that women are very familiar with, and that's girdle. That's what it means. When you girdled yourself, when you were younger, you were able, and what it meant for men in Bible times, in Peter's time, is they had, would have like a belt that they would put over, and they would have the, the flowing uh, uh, outfits, and this would kind of harness this and would gird it about. And they would, like a girdle, and they would put it on. And even on top of that is back in those days is that the, the belt that was made was hollow inside, and they could put money in it. It was like a money belt. And that would be, so it served a bunch of purposes, and it was right there. You're not going to steal it. They didn't have pockets. You didn't have to worry about that. They had it in their belt, okay? He says, when you were young... He says, thou girdest thyself, and he says, you could go wherever you want. You had freedom. You were walking around with that belt. You, you were walking, you wanted to buy something, you go down to your favorite store, and you had your belt, and you had your money, and you could do whatever you want, Peter. He says, you had that freedom, but things are changing. Then came Jesus. Things are changing. And he says, you could go wherever you wanted to walk. And that word walk is there, uh, meant to tread uh, all about freely, giving proof that you had personal liberty. You could go wherever you want. There was nobody, he wasn't a slave. He, he could go wherever he wanted. He could shop wherever he wanted, uh, make the decisions he wanted for his business. And as Jesus put it, he says, thou could do whatever thou wouldest. In other words, when Peter was a young man, his command was sometimes, or his, his wish was sometimes somebody else's command. He could command people to do things. You had a lot of power, Peter. You had freedoms. But it's changing now that you met the master. And the Lord reminded the disciple of his past because it was a stark contrast to his future. Folks, I don't know what your future is. I don't know what my future is. Uh, most of the disciples did not know what their future was. But Jesus gave Peter a glimpse into what his future was. Sometimes it's good not to know our future. <laughs> I'm sure after this conversation, Peter had wished he did not know his future. But he compares it there. He goes, uh, but, but when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird or, or girdle thee, and carry thee, thee whether thou wouldest not. In this prophecy, Jesus predicts Peter's future and final ending. And it's not a good one. 
You know, uh, as, uh, as the normal course of life flows, uh, Peter would eventually age and weaken. That's what he's saying to Peter. He goes, but when you're old, in other words, you are going to live long enough to get old. You're going to get old. You're going to weaken. You're going to be... You're going to be that old man. And I tell you something, I look in the mirror in each passing year and I'm just becoming an old man. I see my dad now. I see my dad when I was younger, what he was at. I'm him. I become my dad. And it, it's, this is something with Peter. It's like, and, 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 and people who are ministers in the Word of God, they're not immune from this. I mean, they get old and they die too. Nobody's immune from this stuff. We're all sinners before a holy God and we all get this. And, and it, so he says... He goes, uh, you know, you're, you're going to get there. And those once strong hands that you had, Peter, because this before, prior to this conversation, he was out fishing. He goes, remember, you're, you're pulling in the fish. You know, you had those big heavy nets because they were heavy. They're all wet and they're filled with those fish. And you're just bringing them in. And you did this day after day. And you never thought anything about it, Peter. You just had those strong hands. And you just kept pulling, pulling in the fish. And you're always doing that. He goes, remember that, Peter? Peter, when you were younger, you never thought twice about it. And you, you remember, Peter, you remember when, when they came to get me, to, to take me from my crucifixion, and they were going to take me, and they were going to beat me and everything else? You remember how fast your hand was pulling out that sword and, and, st- and striking that, that uh, Roman soldier there? You remember how, how, how quick your, your hand was? That, well, that hand's going to get weaker, and it's going to get slower. You're going to age. And the process is going to go through, and you're going to get to that stage. It, uh, if this was not... If this was not depressing enough, Jesus advised Simon Peter that at the end, Peter would use his hands one last time in the ministry of the Lord. One last time. He says, at the very end of your life, you're going to minister for me one last time. You know what you do with those hands? Not fishing, not striking with swords. He goes, you're going to willfully, you are going to do this. No man's going to take them from you. You're going to willfully, voluntarily submit your hands to be bound, to be girt by another person. Think about it. When you look at that scripture, G, uh, Peter was going to do that. A lot of times we think that they, 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 they were kicking and screaming. The apostles were not kicking and screaming when they were, they were taken in by the authorities. They willfully submitted because they weren't submitting to the authorities so much as they were the God that sent them there. And they said, as my Savior went as a, as a lamb to, the, uh, to, to be slaughtered, am I any better? Why am I kicking and screaming? And he goes, and they're going to bound your hands. And they're going to carry you. They're going to lead you. They're going to direct you to a place you don't want to go. And he's talking about it. It says right there. And inter- the scripture interprets itself. He says, you, you talk about what manner of death. And he realized what it meant. And those hands, you're going to willfully put them out there. And they're going to nail them. The last thing you're going to hear, Peter, the last thing in your life here on earth, after you get old and you get weak and you get slowed down, the last thing you're going to hear is you're going to hear the sound of nails being pounded through your flesh and going into the wood. That's what you're going to hear, Peter. And they're going to lift you up in a place that you don't want to be, at the outside of a city for all to to laugh and to mock and throw things at you, just like they did me, Peter. This is the story. This is the conversation they're having. This is it. Usually when, when, when one leader passes on and he's bringing in the new leader, he gives them a real rousing kind of message. This was not that type of message. This was an open and honest, very honest thing. He said, this is what's going to happen. This is your future, Peter. After you've spent all those years feeding my lambs, feeding my sheep, and feeding my sheep, after you've done all that, this is what you get. This is your reward, is you're going to hear the nails and feel the pain of those nails going through you that's it and so when you die peter you're going to die gasping for breath it's going to be a horrible death it's going to be horrible you're going to die just grasping trying to get breath and and breath of life and he says you're going to die alone you see a lot of people what we want to do is we want to die don't we peacefully in our sleep surrounded by our loved ones at home he says peter you're not going to get that opportunity you're not going to get that opportunity you're going to die alone, miserable, and your enemy's going to be there laughing at you as you die. And the Bible says he was talking about which manner of death he was going to, to go through to glorify God. And here's what I learned about this, is that God looks from a different angle. Oh, we're looking up at this guy that, that's being crucified and we're laughing at him. Yeah, we got you. Look at this. 
You're going to die. It hurts, doesn't it, Christian? And they're all laughing. God's looking from a different angle down. And God gets glory even when his saints die. There's no such thing as a useless old saint. There is not in God's eyes. Those people that are laying in, in, in the, the hospital beds or, or the nursing homes or hospice and all these cares and stuff, and they're fighting for their last breath, and they're old and they're weak, and, and we look at them and we say, you know, uh, you know what, what good are they? God's looking down with a different view, and he's saying, these people are glorifying me. These saints are glorifying me. And when they've passed from the scene, and, and the Holy Spirit is with them all the time, as long as there's breath in your, in your lungs, the Holy Spirit's with you. And when the breath leaves you and you go to heaven, it's the Holy Spirit. He's the earnest, the Bible says. He's our down payment. He's our seal. He goes with us and delivers us personally into the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. And who gets the glory in all that? The Father does, because He sent His Son to do that. And so as soon as we breathe our last breath, and as people are laughing and cheering at us, saying that they got the victory, on God's point of view, it's totally different. He goes, oh, there's another saved one. There's another lamb. Come home. My children are coming home one at a time. And look, the faith that they had, that they would put up and endure all that for my sake, God gets the glory. God doesn't get any glory when we're self-willed. There's no self-will in that. If we go out there and we start beating on doors and forcing people to get saved, there's no glory in that. The glory is in praying and, and being obedient to God. And when you talk to people, when you do knock on doors, when you do talk to people, give them the gospel in truth and in love and let God do the work. Don't force it. We can't for, get rid of the will and let God have rule in our lives. What kind of church do you want to be? And I, I, do you want a church that's afraid? You want to come out to church because you're always afraid of losing your salvation or you're afraid of this or afraid of Or do you want to come out to a church that lifts up God and celebrates God in the truth of His Word, realizing that every single word in here is His truth? And that as, as you go through it all, you realize something, and that is God really loves you. And that even your death is a glory and a testament to Him. And He's waiting for you to open His arms up and, and to greet you there. I'm looking at that. So these, this is the message of, of, to Peter. To Peter. And so we'll go to the next line there, and I'll go real quickly over the next, uh, the next two. So we have a, a deadly command. And the second thing we see, we have a demonstrated command. And in the demonstrated command, this one has been demonstrated by not Peter, but by another man, the name of John. So if you look there in John chapter 21, verse 20, it says, Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved, following, which also leaned on his breast at supper, and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? The Bible says that, that Peter's turned about. Now, here's an interesting thing. You, won't, you probably won't get it in the English, but it's, in there, it's there in the Greek. And that is, is that it's in, the, it, it's in the passive tense. In other words, when he turned about, it was Peter didn't turn about on his own. Okay, It wasn't his idea to turn about. Something made him turn about. It's interesting. And he, so that bothered me. And I started studying this. Out. I'm thinking, what do, you, what do you mean? What do you mean it's in the passive voice? It's not in the active voice. It sounds to me like Peter just turned about. No, something or someone caused him to turn about. And here's what I think it was. When I get looking at the scriptures and I find it, it's like, when you think about it, Jesus is having a walk and a talk with Peter. And as they're walking, he's telling, he's laying them some heavy stuff. He's saying, you don't understand, after you do all this stuff for me, this is how you're going to die. This is how it's going to end, Peter. And what's going on in Peter's mind? Can you imagine? Because Peter saw Jesus die. Peter saw him get beaten. Peter saw him get laughed at and spit at and ridiculed. Peter saw that, and it's going through his mind. It's flooding his mind. It's like in true living color, he's seeing, oh man, that's what happened to the Lord. That's what's going to happen to me. That's what's going on. And then it's almost like he snapped his fingers, and Jesus said, follow me. And all of a sudden, the vision stopped for a minute, and he heard something. And it was that something that caused him to turn around. And who was it? John. All this time they were having this conversation, he was so into the conversation, Peter was. He was so thinking and he, was, he had so much uh, triggering in his mind that it wasn't until, follow me. And all of a sudden he hears the, and he looks around and he sees John. 
John demonstrated what it was to be a follower of Jesus. This is, and he was following. G, uh, Peter, uh, I'm sorry, Peter needed a command. John didn't need the command, did he? He was already following Jesus. He was the demonstration. If you go through the, the, the four Gospels, time and time again, who's the, who's the disciple who's closest to Jesus? It's John. John's always a follower. He's a fo- natural follower of the Savior. What a great example is he. And so they're walking, and he turns around, and he, and he, and he hears the voice, and he, or I'm sorry, he hears the footsteps, and there's John right there following him. I don't think John was invited. This was a conversation between him and Peter. John couldn't help himself. There goes Peter. There goes Jesus. I better be with the Savior. And he's trying to catch up, and he's following along. And all of a sudden, he wakes up, and he looks around, turns around, and he, says to, he sees him following. And he says to the Savior, and uh, what about this guy? Paraphrasing a little bit. What about this guy? Oh, what's going to happen to him? And I love Jesus' response to him. He basically said, what's it to you? What's it to you, Peter? I like, in our King James, it was, it was translated over, slightly over 400 years ago. And, you know, what is that to thee? We haven't changed much because basically you kind of get the, the, the gist of what, what Jesus is saying. He's being very short with him. He says, what's it to you? What's it got to do with you, Peter? I'm talking to you. Hello? Don't worry about the guy following us. What about you? And what was ironic about it, it's kind of funny in a way, is that right after Jesus said, follow me, what's the first thing he does? He doesn't follow, he looks backwards. Peter, see what I mean? Peter's got some problems here. Not only is he not loving him tremendously or tenderly, he's just liking him. He's also got a problem with following him because he's still that self-will. And then he starts asking about this guy. And it's like, Peter, did you not get anything I just said to you? I'm telling you, I'm laying this heavy stuff on you, what you got to do. And I said, follow me. And he said, so we have the demonstrated part. And then thirdly, uh, finally, we have the direct command. The, uh, the direct command. And, and I, like, uh, I like what happened with that. In verse 22, Jesus saith unto him, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is, it, is, is that to thee? In other words, what's it to you? And here it is. Now he says, follow thou me. That's more direct, isn't it? He says, in other words, Peter, you follow me. Don't worry about him. Don't worry about anybody else. You follow me. And I've already told you. I mean, like, like there's, there's been no salesmanship here. I've already been to- told you that when you do follow me, it's going to the cross. You're going to get old, weak. But you're going to have to fight and struggle to keep that church going. And at the end of it, it's going to be a miserable, horrible, lonely death. Follow me. Don't worry about him. And he says, you know, if, I, if he tarries till I come again, none of your business. And of course, the rumor mill got going. The Bible says later on that the brethren started going, hey, I hear John's not going to die. Jesus never said that. We get, sometimes there's rumor mills going to church, eh? Hey, did you build it? And we start spreading things that aren't even true. We, there are bits and pieces we pull out of the Word of God and we make it look like it's gospel. It's not. That's why we, we got to really listen to what's being said here. Jesus didn't say he was going to tarry until the second coming. He said, what if he did? It's none of your business, Peter. I got a job for you. And here's where I want to close with this for you and for me. Is that God has a plan. He has a road to go down. If you go to the next slide there, please. He has a road for you to go down. And everybody's got a different road, okay? I don't know how your road's going to go. I don't know if it's going to have a lot of ups and downs, bumps and, and holes in it. I don't know if it's going to have whiny turns. I don't know what you've got. At the end of that road, I don't know if you've got a, a cross. Uh, I don't know if you're going to die. I don't know if you're going to die like Peter horribly on the cross, or I don't know if you're going to die like John peacefully of old age. Don't know. These two men had different endings, didn't they? Slightly different roads, different endings. But there was always one thing that they needed in common. That was submission to the Lord. Fight your self-will. Submit to the Lord. Get into His Word. And follow that road all the way to the end. Because in the end, God gets the glory. If we start deviating and fighting it, the glory is not all there. God gets the glory in the the death of a saint. 
And so my encouragement to you as I look at this in this final conversation is make sure that you have the right fellowship, all right? Do you love me more than these? Because it's the, it's the, the fellowship that leads to a proper and successful followship. Follow thou me. You're not going to follow him if you don't have a strong fellowship. We need to be in the Word of God. We need to be amongst uh, in people in church and growing and praying for each other, encouraging one another, and sharing our faith with one another and other people too. We need to be active and busy and stuff like that. But we need to have a fellowship so that we can have a good fellowship. Peter, how did Peter end up? Well, tradition has it that he was crucified upside down. It's not in the Bible, but that's the tradition. One thing I do know that he did is that he was crucified because that's in the Bible. Peter knew exactly what Jesus was talking about. And he knew that his road led to the cross. Folks, regardless of what the road is for you and the ending, follow him. Don't follow me. Don't follow the friends around you. Don't be startled and have a knee-jerk reaction like Peter did and say, well, what about this or what about... Follow. Follow him. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you again for your word. And Lord, we thank you for this conversation between these two men. So much to learn. So much to learn. And also from John's example of what it is to follow Jesus Christ without even having to be told. But Lord, we know that you took your time and you worked with Peter. We know the successes. We know the thousands of people that came to know the Lord because of that one man who was so stubborn and self-willed, but slowly and surely got the message and was willing to submit himself, even to the point where he was imprisoned and, and eventually beaten and, and, and putting it onto the cross of his own cross. But Lord, what about us? It's been 2,000 years now. We don't know where the road leads. Some of us might be raptured, and praise God, we look forward to that. But some of us also might have to face our own crosses. Some of us might just weaken and die of old age. But either way, Lord, we know that you get the glory. Either way, we know we don't die alone. Even though we say it's alone, the Holy Spirit's always with us. Your presence is always with us, and we thank you for it. And Lord, oh, what gain it is when a saint dies and they open their eyes and they see their Savior, and they see the, the, thr the throne room of God, and we, they see the saints. What a, what a vision that is, Lord. Help us to have that blessed hope. Help us to look forward to Jesus Christ coming for us. We are not alone. Our God is with us. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.